Well, thank you very much to Miller Research for inviting me to speak today. I, I came to the conference a couple of years ago because um, at the time I was very much involved in organising the um, Oldborough Food and Drink Festival as well. Um, I'm now kind of vaguely involved in that, less hands-on. Um, but I also run a business called Food Safari, um, which I know some of you in the room know of because you follow me on Twitter. Um, but what we do is we run um, loosely and label them as field to fork experience days. So really what I'm trying to do is tap into um, the kind of whole interest in food tourism. Um, we're, we're based on the Suffolk coast um, and the whole idea of Food Safari is that it goes beyond a traditional cookery school because it's all about working with food and drink producers. Um, we started as a kind of pop-up cookery school in different places, but we now have this beautiful barn um, about 10 miles from Oldborough where we run most of our courses. Um, and what I really wanted to do with Food Safari was encourage people to think more about where food comes from, to connect with the people that produce it, um, to appreciate what goes into producing it, and, and to have an authentic experience. So here's some... Um, people visiting um, Blytheborough Free Range Pork, which is one of only a handful of commercial, large-scale free range pork farms in the country. Um, so, so Food Safari is all about meeting the experts. It's about getting kind of behind the scenes access to places, um, learning new skills, and always at the end of the day having a big gourmet feast and having lots of food and there's something about bringing together people over a meal afterwards that, that really seals the experience. So th this is um, one of our pop-up dinners in the barn. So th my inspiration for doing Food Safari is actually rooted in Wales. My aunt and uncle um, farm in North Wales near Denby, um, they have what was the first certified organic farm in North Wales, kind of um, in the mid-70s, late-70s before most people even knew what organic meant. And, you know, they've struggled through the time, completely committed to sort of sustainable farming, and um, they, they work incredibly hard. And I, I, I love spending time there, and their passion about food and sustainability has really rubbed off on me, and that's where I have my interest um, comes from. On the flip side, I lived in London for years, and we used to shop at our local farmer's market in Islington pretty much every week and we'd go to Borough Market. And what I loved about doing that was about meeting producers and it was exactly as Alison said, it was about being able to talk to people about their products, hear their story, find out what the point of, you know, what's different about what they do. And it's when you've had that engagement, you, you want to, you develop a loyalty, you want to spend money with them and so on. But what great all the time and I'm sure many of you in the room have heard the same thing it's like I love going to farmers markets and farm shops but they're so expensive and that just always really gets my back up because I think if you know what's gone in and when you see how how hard people will work you know my aunt and uncle will and cousins now involved as well a couple of days just preparing for one market and then they'll get up at crack of dawn to drive to somewhere in Cheshire or the Wirral to do their market. A lot goes into it and if you understand the quality of ingredients, like Alison was saying about having the best ingredients there, then you start to value it more. Um, and I worked for a stint, um, my background's kind of in marketing, um, but I worked for about five years as a consultant to the arts, doing mainly doing corporate sponsorship and in the arts People will pay a premium to literally, in this case, go behind the scenes and meet the actors. My whole idea of Food Safari was exactly that. It was to go behind the scenes of a farmer's market, to meet the producers, hear their stories and see where it really happens. Um, I think this is kind of um, something that um, has worked because I think people are bored of traditional cookery schools. I think going on a course to learn French dinner party cooking or Thai cooking for the day. I mean, it's, you know, it's not dead, but I think times have moved on. People want to do something different. They want to get back to basics. I think people are interested in learning more about the food chain. And for me, with Food Safari, it's also very much about a sense of place and, um, 
and connecting with that and what makes the region special, you know, that farming and, and fishing has always shaped our landscape and, and seascape and that's very important to, to what my business is about. Um, here are some children with the, the Berkshire Sow at our um, venue. Um, and I think linking into what the minister was talking about, I think at one end of the spectrum, there is a whole range of people who are um, avid watchers of food programs on TV. They, like me, are addicted to buying food books and recipe books. And I'm told that um, you know, recipe books are one of the only sectors that publishers are being acquisitive about at the moment. It's a growing, growing thing. And there is an interest in the source of our food and going to food festivals and farmers markets. But at the other end of the spectrum, the, you know, um, buying takeaway food is on the increase, ready meals, processed food. We're the, the fattest nation in Europe and, you know, cheap and processed food remains a staple. So there are, I think there are two things going on here and there's, there's quite a big gap in the middle. Um, and I think really with Food Safari, we are kind of serving the, the, top, the first part of that that I talked about. But the second part is really important to me and we do do stuff with schools and so on and that's certainly something that I want to grow to kind of join it all up. Some sausage making which is one of our most popular courses. Um, so I think again a traditional cookery school client was often a woman um, who's wanting to learn dinner party skills or cake making and so on and so forth. But I think TV chefs like Gordon Ramsay and Jamie Oliver have, have really made it popular amongst men. And I would think on our courses, at least 50%, if not 60% of our attendees are actually men, um, which I think is, is another uh, an interesting change. And I think it's a lot about sort of sh uh, displaying some new macho skills, whether that's butchery or um, catching your fish and then... Um, and then, you know, preparing it. Um, I think there are, I mean, it, you only need to do a few simple searches on Google now, and you find an inordinate number of cookery schools around the country. Um, and people, it is something that people want to do in their leisure time. Um, and, you know, to have an experience, not just to go to a place um, and maybe visit the restaurants or go to the local shops, but actually, um, you know, do something hands-on and finally I think there's a real thing about blagging rights if you talk to people in tourism that's a, something a sort of term that always comes up at tourism conferences that I go to about blagging rights and I think um, we get a lot of Londoners and other people who, who aren't country folk at all but it's all about going into the office on Monday morning and saying you'll never guess what I did at the weekend I skinned and gutted a rabbit and I you know, plucked a pheasant and it's, you know, they're not people who are going to do it in their everyday life, but they like to boast about it. Um, this is one of our um, whole pig butchery courses. Um, butchery um, is one of the most popular things that we do and it's all quite ironic because when I started Food Safari, I was completely vegetarian and had been for a long time. <laughs> and... Um, and I kind of kept it quiet that I was a vegetarian for a long time. I used to go on the courses and not eat the lunch, and people would say, why aren't you eating lunch? And I was trying to figure it out in my mind. And actually now, I think it's very obvious. I, it's very clear to me now. The reason that I became vegetarian when I was 15, 14, 15, was all an anti-factory farming, you know, poor animal wel welfare related thing because another aunt and uncle are very sort of whole foodie vegetarians um, but I knew from my Welsh aunt and uncle that animals that were well cared for and, and so on were, were okay and I was used to secretly eat their meat but I kept it quite quiet <laughs> and, <laughs> and what, what I realised with Food Safari is if I'm getting people coming on butchery workshops and they're learning to understand the value of meat, how precious it is that it's not a commodity about learning to use the whole animal and so on, then actually that's exactly the same reason why I became vegetarian in the first place. 
So, so now I do eat a bit of meat, but I'm quite fussy, and I'll only me eat meat when I, when I know where it comes from. But it is very much joined up with this message about um, valuing the food that we eat. Um, on our courses, we do get small holders, and we do have, have, we've had a few people who have come along and said, oh, oh, we've got a pig club in our village and things like that, and they perhaps uh, want to learn how to butcher their own meat. And I read recently, I don't know if anyone heard, has heard, else has heard this, but apparently B&Q now got quite a large market in selling pig styes, which I think is hysterical. But there you go, it's becoming mainstream. Um, but as I said, we also get a lot of city types, and um, I kind of covered that, really. Um, this was a school of event for a, a group of year 10s learning how to do sausage making. And it was quite funny because the teacher who booked it, it as their end of term treat, thought that it was supposed to be an educational day. And then she realised that all the other groups were going off doing things like paintballing and so on. And, and apparently all these kids were really annoyed that they were going off to make sausages and go wild food foraging. But actually, they had a great day, and, and um, I overheard one of them saying, oh, everyone else was saying we were going to have such a boring day, but actually it was great, and, and that was just music to my ears, really. Um, another area that we do, and again, there are dozens of bread-making courses across the country, but there seemed to be no, no end of interest in bread-making. And I think, again, perhaps this is linked partly to people understanding more about food and learning how much junk and preservatives and additives are put in shop-bought bread to make it last on the shelves. Um, there's obviously a rise of artisan bakeries around the country. Um, but also I think there's a, perhaps a recessionary factor that people realise they can make bread very cheaply at home. And what we try and... We run two bread-making courses, um, um, sort of beginners and um, beginners one and a more advanced one that's more around sourdoughs and enriched pastries but on the first one what we really try and teach is the idea that there are ways to fit bread making into a busy lifestyle by speeding it up by, or slowing it down by putting it to proof in the fridge overnight and that kind of thing and that's what people really want to learn so they want to get away from being dependent on buying everything um, to to kind of be a bit more creative and it fits into the whole home growing thing but they also need to adapt it to the way that we live now which is busier and busier so here's some folk doing bread making you can even see in that picture that most of the people on that bread making course were men um, the other area of, of courses that we do that are incredibly popular are wild food foraging and again there are lots of wild food foraging courses across the country. Some are just um, run by the National Trust or the Wildlife Trust, things like that. Um, others are linked to kind of bushcraft skills. Ours, we try and focus on the kind of the foodie side of it. So we, we link the foraging to some cookery and eating on a big fe wild food feast afterwards. And again, I think this is perhaps something that has, you know, there are two reasons behind this. One is... Um, perhaps recession driven this idea that wild food is food for free um, which obviously Richard maybe was um, talking about a long time ago but that's kind of getting out there now but also this idea of, of environmental awareness and wanting to get back to the land and being aware of the world around us um, and I think well Hugh Fernie Whitting still on the River Cottage programs but also Scandinavian chefs have done a lot to make wild food very fashionable now um, and the idea that there are new ingredients that are giving you new tastes and experiences that perhaps have been widely available before but been neglected. Um, so tomorrow in London we're doing our first urban foraging course which has attracted lots of interest. So this idea that you don't have to live in the country but apparently in Berkeley Square there's an amazing mulberry tree that nobody knows about or, you know, wild... Um, plums or mush you know you can find wild fungus in the parks and so on so that's going to be quite an interesting day but we're taking our finds back to a cookery teacher where we do some cookery and preserving with them um, so one of the things that i was asked to talk about in particular was the impact of the recession on 
how how people want you know cookery schools and so on um, and I think, pe as I've said, people are wanting to learn new skills, but they're, they're quite con cost conscious as well. Um, and so what I'm trying to do now with the business is, is adapt it a bit to that. We have in the past done lots of um, corporate events, and I've noticed in the last six months that corporate bookings are really down. Um, I've um, recently done a whole load of proposals for, for corporate things, and and then they don't come off and it's not because they're going off to do paintballing instead, it's just that they're not doing the event this year. So I think people are cutting back on spending. Um, but what I'm trying to do with Food Safari to adapt to that is to do more half-day courses. We run a series of evening butchery workshops and I want to do more of that and more kind of taster events and family events as well. Um, and as I mentioned, we're also just starting to take Food Safari out of Suffolk and we're running some courses in London and hopefully elsewhere too. This is the um, school group that I talked about. So we're just... Um, my idea with Food Safari was always that it was very much about a sense of place and that you could replicate it in different parts of the country and it would take on a very different flavour. So Suffolk is famous for pigs or... A, I, I've never actually found the, the figures to back this up, but everybody says there are more pigs in Suffolk than there are people. And, um, and, obviously, and East Anglia, um, a beer expert once told me, East Anglia is to beer what um, the Champagne region is to fizzy wine because we grow the best malting barley in, in the country. Um, but equally, we might, you know, we don't, there's not very much dairy, sadly, in Suffolk anymore. And um, uh, although we have aspals, there's not much cider making. So, you know, we might run courses in Somerset or the West Country that were more about cheese making or, or cider making, for example. And um, what I've discovered through talking to people on our courses is, you know, a lot of them are coming from the cities um, and they'll they'll come to Suffolk for Easter because they want to do a pork course, but they'd be just as happy to go somewhere else, um, you know, for their next weekend break or bank holiday weekend or whatever. And we talked about the urban foraging. Um, and um, so, yes, we're starting now in London, and, and the courses that we're going to do in London will be a bit different. They'll be m much shorter, half-day, evening courses. So we're going to do something with the London Honey Company, um, we'll do more urban foraging, we'll do more butchery. The ginger pig um, who run courses in Marylebone is massively oversubscribed um, and um, there you know, seems to be an opportunity there. Um, I think that's about it, really. Um, so, yes, yeah, so Food Safari is really... I've just tried to make it different to a traditional cookery school and tap into people wanting to get back to some basic skills that have been perhaps lost for a few generations. Polly, thank you very much.